or steam-powered trains roared along nearly 20,000 miles of railways throughout the British Isles. But in July 1940, the Luftwaffe launched the largest bombing campaign the world had ever seen in preparation for Operation Sea Lion, the invasion of Britain. One of the bombers' main objectives was to cripple Britain's railways and so paralyze the movement of troops, raw materials and munitions. Suddenly, every railway worker in Britain found themselves in the firing line. You could see the searchlights, you could see the flashes, but my job was to keep that locomotive going, to keep that locomotive in steam, to keep the water in the boiler. And that drew all your attention. Our train caught fire at Cardiff in the almighty explosion. Flames come out everywhere and I jumped down, uncoupled, and we shifted the engine away a bit. Bombs were dropping everywhere. After that, I thought, well, I can't be in nothing worse than this, and that's how I did it. That's, that's what I honestly thought. Be it weapons, coal or people, the men who carried the loads that fueled the nation's war machine faced untold dangers on the railways of Britain. This is the story of their finest hour. In 1939, it became clear to the government that U-boat attacks would have a dramatic impact on the supply of oil. Rapid pre-war growth in road transport would be of no use in the defense of the country. The only alternative was a big shift back to the railways, an industry that ran at a loss. On the 1st of September, the government took control of the big four companies, Great Western, Southern, London and Northeastern, and London, Midland and Scottish Railways. But despite employment in the industry being made a reserved occupation, a shortage of manpower meant vacancies on the railways. Aged 16, Harry Dibner from Bolton wanted to get a job on the LMS. Being a railway family, I went down to the locomotive shed and they started me almost immediately. And I found out very quickly there were six young men signed on duty every four hours around the clock. Ronald Trust wanted to work for the GWR in his hometown of Newton Abbott in Devon. As soon as I became 16, they sent for me as a cleaner. And a dirty old job it was too. You went to the charge and who was in charge of you all. And then we would go to these locomotives and use the oily first, doing like a round shapes like this, so it would take the all over the tender and that. And then you add the other waste and cleaned it all off, and it all come up shiny now, look, see? Clean be that oily. When the big four companies had been formed in 1923, they took over production of their own locomotives. But despite the competition for faster trains, by the outbreak of war, many locomotives built in the Edwardian era were still in use on Britain's railways. The sudden demand on old rolling stock meant a busy time at the maintenance sheds. 17-year-old Richard Hardy worked for the LNER. There was no let up. There simply was no let up. As soon as you'd finished a, a locomotive, there were two on the pit. As soon as you'd done your work on one, to give it as part of the general overhaul, my mate and I would go on to the other engine on the pit. And alongside us would be a man with a pneumatic riveter who would come from the boiler shop to do some riveting. Well, if you've been a foot away from a pneumatic riveter, you, uh, you know, you can't think hardly for the noise. As railway workers toiled in different parts of the country in the early months of the war, few yet knew of the horrors of a bombing raid. But the Luftwaffe knew that the station and depot at Newton Abbott was an important junction for rail links between Plymouth and London. On the evening of the 20th of August, 1940, 
three German bombers approached the Devon town. We was on the two to 10 shift, and we'd have done our about four hours work of cleaning different engines that they'd have told us to do. And we'd have broke off now for our break. They were in their food and all of a sudden, the door got blew right open from our cabin. A lot of a noise and crashing and banging and smoke and dust everywhere. And as I was running out with the rest, I heard somebody shout help. And I stopped and one of the other poor old cleaners had been shoved. Others trying to get out the way and he had slipped in underneath this boiler. There's a pit there, like, see? I did stop and grabbed hold of him and pulled him up out of it. And it would be all right, yeah, yeah. I said, well, come on, let's get out, keep running. So it runs on a bit further and there's this big hole in the wall where the blast from the bomb and that had knocked it out. So I went out through there. And uh, well, sheer panic, I thought, well, what am I doing? What am I going to do? And then there's a look opposite. He shouted, what's it like in there? I said, well, terrible. And, I, and then and all of a sudden he shouted, look out. And I, look out, and I, and I dive right into the, the wall that was there and this, uh, Aeroplane. He, he was coming right up down, right down through Ford Road. Machine guns going. There you go, all the thinking bullets coming up a road. It, oh, of course, being only 16 and a half, I was up and running now. And with this machine gun going, I thought, oh my God, I, I've had bloody had it, you're. But uh, he missed me, thank Christ. <laughs> Many in Newton Abbott were not so lucky. 15 people lost their lives in the raid, amongst them four who worked for the Great Western Railway. But the death and destruction caused that summer's evening was just a taster of things to come in the war on the railways. In the summer of 1940, as the Battle of Britain raged in the skies above southern England, the government scrambled to get the railways organized for war. The massive increase in traffic on the network and the hemorrhaging of manpower to the forces brought swift promotion to one of the most coveted jobs in the industry, firemen alongside the driver of a locomotive. As teenaged boys joined experienced railway men on the footplates, they quickly had to learn about coal-fired engines and steam locomotion. Kenneth Death became a fireman at the age of 16 Really, as a young fireman, you really want to know the road as much as that driver, right? and know him, what he's getting up to. And if he's a very heavy driver, then you're going to get through some coal. So far, you've got a freight, freight train, and you've got so many hundred tons behind you, like, you know, and the driver would start knocking the chimney off it, using plenty of steam to get up this bank. Well, you've got to be really prepared for that before he starts that. So you've got quite a bit of coal cold to shovel on the fire before he ever starts that performance. But I loved it, you know, you know I could, it was lovely to hear an engine really working hard, like, you know, but uh, it, was, it was hard work because you had to distribute the coal around the firebox and them fireboxes could be anything up to about nine foot long and uh, you get quite a bit of coal in there and the draught on them it makes them white hot. When you would open your firebox door, you could see where it needed coal because it was white and the other was red. And you could see where you got to drop your coal. The pride of the Great Western Railway during the war were the King and Castle series of locomotives. These huge engines carried six tonnes of coal per journey. Hard work for firemen like Charlie Rutherford. You didn't shovel it in anyhow, you had to put it where you thought the engine was burning it. And those fire boxes on a king, 12 foot 6 long, and on a castle they were 11 foot 6 long. So you can tell, to get it up under the brick arch, you had to throw it out, you know, you couldn't just put it in like that. Where you got crossings, if you weren't used to the job, the engine would roll and you would grab at anything, you know. You do not stand on a footplate with your legs stiff or you'll be thrown all over the place. 
You had always to keep your legs bent in a knee, in a bent position to ride in like a jockey. As Britain's war machine began to develop and more and more freight haulage was transferred to the railways, the use of old engines became a factor for the locomotive crews. Some engines had good names, some had bad names. Some engines, I can recall them, that were excellent engine right through their career and some wasn't at all nice if you know what I mean you used to say oh we got that blooming thing again like you know you go to London and back and it was beautiful another time it was misery the prime object of those men was to get to their destination on time. Now they might, for example, have got an indifferent engine that was not up to the job, but we really were up against it. For steam and water, hauling heavy trains in the night, sleeping car trains or trains packed with soldiers, and we were really up against it. Scheduling the deluge of work on the railways became a major challenge for managers and crew. You sign on, say, about six o'clock of a night time, and the driver say, you are up for 12 hours then, son? Say, yeah, OK, then, like, you know. And you would be doing 12 hours, cos they know how the job would run. Because you've been known to work 14 hours. You know, you've been... You was on a train, and then you've been put in a loop somewhere away from any depot, and there you had to wait. At times that you got that tired that you'd sit there waiting to see the signal come off and you'd go drop off. <laughs> you'd drop off to sleep, you couldn't help yourself. When you got home and that was just a matter of wash off and in the bed and you was out, finished like. I was shown my bedroom, which was just like a, a cupboard in effect, and it had one bed in. And when I got undressed to get into that bed, I was so tired, not even washed or nothing. I was so tired, I got into that bed, and that bed was still damp with the sweat from the last person who'd been in there. The sheer volume of materials being transported often took the rail network to near breaking point. Each class of engine was designed to pull or push a certain weight, but many engines were assigned much heavier loads. Each train needed a route plan, but timetables that had always been calculated in great detail became immensely complicated affairs with the addition of hundreds of extra trains. As freight crisscrossed the country, journey times could be very long in the war. The line from Avonmouth to London was like a great pipeline. There were goods trains all the way to London. They'd go from one station into the next station where there's a loop and all moving, all moving gradually. So even though it took hours perhaps to get to the London, it was arriving all the time. The specially built wagons full of iron ore from Cambridgeshire up to uh, Sheffield, to the blast furnace. Hey, man, they were hard work. You never, ever stop shoveling. During the war, well over one and a half million wagons of all shapes and sizes were on constant move across Britain. But for the locomotive crews, the most important carried loads marked WD for War Department. The great range of munitions, armoured vehicles and aircraft components were officially kept secret from the crews, but knowing when the load consisted of explosives could make the difference between life and death. Harry Dibner was alerted by his driver near Bolton one day. He says, come and look. When I got down, I said, what the hell are these? They must have been 12,000 pound bombs on each bomb was on each crocodile wagon. And I said to my mate, 
what the hell are we going to do? I said, this engine's not big enough for this load. Well, he said, I told him we wanted a class eight. I said, a little looks like it. I said, we're 500 strength. He set off. It looked like the fire train had turned out. Oh, oh knocking hell out that locomotive. We'd be doing about 12 mile an hour. We went through Bolton Station and we dipped down and then we got this eight mile bank all the way to the top. So we whistled for a banker and it wanted to come behind us. So we got two bankers behind us, right? So the locomotive at the front and two at back. Pounded our way eight mile up, right to the top of the bank. Now, whenever you had an ammunition train or anything like that, explosives, you had not to pin brakes down on the wagons for sparks starting. It was just safety precautions. So we could not pin brakes down on those crocodile wagons. So we went over the top into that tunnel and before we'd gone half a mile through that tunnel, we couldn't hold it. We could not hold it with a Class 3 locomotive. They were pushing us to hell. So as soon as we came out of that tunnel, I'm on that whistle. I didn't need no telling from him. Pop, 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 pop. Never stopped. Beep, 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 beep. That indicates to each pointsman we can't stop. We can't stop. We went through Lower Darwin, Darwin Station, Blackburn Station, like a dose of Andrew's liver salts. Swept through, swept through. The driver managed to keep control and another bank slowed the train enough for the brakes to be applied safely. But after coming to a stop in what they thought was the middle of nowhere, the driver and his fireman had a second shock when directed to reverse by their guard. He got the, the, the light to come back. Waved side to side means come on back. I said, go back. I said, where the hell are we going to? We're on the main line. There is no sidings here. He kept waving it back. So we said, look, we eased it back slowly. And then we saw the train. It was just breaking dawn. We saw the train going in like that. We were going into the fields. And when we backed all the way back into the fields, we didn't see one. We saw hundreds and thousands of bombs, shells, ammunition cases. And we'd been past that chat burner scores of times and we never ever seen it. These arsenals were precisely the type of target German reconnaissance hoped to find. They had already been successful directing their bombers to terminals like Portsmouth and Clapham Junction. This was despite the railway's best efforts with blackout precautions. But for the men of the footplate, containing the light from the cab could be difficult. On the big engines, you had a top sheet fastened to the tender with springs. You had two side sheets and two small side sheets. And when all that was down, it was like a furnace then. Because those fireboxes threw out tremendous heat, you know. Of course, it couldn't escape. It was shut in and you were breathing it, you were in it. It was like a Turkish bath. You should take your hat off and have a handkerchief and four knotted and keep on your head and it'd soak up some sweat up. <laughs> But the death rate of railway workers increased dramatically because of the blackout. When we drove at night, you, it was all pitch black. You couldn't see anything. Like, you know, you, more or less driving blind you were. All you were controlled by was the signals. If you got off the locomotive, you took your driver's hand lamp. He had a paraffin hand, hand lamp, and you took that with you to see where you was going. I remember we just put this train into commercial row, and I was going to change the lamps and I got out of the cab and stood on what I thought was a platform. And my driver calmly said to me, Ken, get back in the cab, please, now. And I stepped back in the cab, and I'd actually stood on the wall with at least a 50-foot drop the other side, and I'd stood on this wall.
Good signalling was fundamental in coping with the thousands of trains moving around wartime Britain, 24 hours a day. And signalmen carried a heavy responsibility being in charge of the only means of communication with the crews. In times of enemy air raids, a system of coloured lights informed the men of imminent attack. It was going dark and every cabin we came across, we had the red light from the signalman telling us there was aircraft overhead. You can't hear nothing on the footplate, not when it's in full throw. The noise is so terrific. You have to literally shout in the driver's ear to make yourself heard. And that happened from then. Whenever you opened that firebox door, you had to shut it damn quick. So the driver would look, see if the road was clear with the signals, and then he opened the firebox door, you chucked the call and shut it. And that, that went on till you got sufficient call on. And the damper door underneath, where the draft used to come from to burn the coal, you had to reduce it, because that was like a searchlight. You understand me? It was like a searchlight lighting all the ground up. Whether a load was war department or hundreds of people, crews had a duty to get trains through to their destination. On the 8th of March, 1941, Ron Hacker fired a passenger train on the Great Western Railway. This particular night, we was booked 620 London. Where we goes up above Reading, we get stopped. The signalman told us, air raid warning yellow. That means to say, raiders were over the coast nearest to where we were. We soldiered on, hadn't gone too far, stopped again by a signalman, air raid warning blue. They were then above us. Hadn't gone very far, then it was air raid warning red. You're right in it, then. Well, it was really going some now. The shrapnel was coming down like rain, right above us. We reduced speed to 25 mile an hour and crawled into Paddington. And before we had actually stopped, people were out of the train running alongside of us to get to the underground. Fifteen people were killed in and around Paddington, St Pancras and Marylebone stations that night. For the men of the footplate, coping with bombs had become part of the job. During the months of the Blitz, the Luftwaffe launched raid after raid against British cities with key communication links high on the bomber's agenda. Dockyards where convoys unloaded raw materials were a frequent target, and so were the trains that carried the precious cargoes to destinations all over Britain. But once under attack, a driver and fireman had no means of defence. We had petrol trains every hour out of Avonmouth for Acton, London. And we came out one night at 6.30, all the way up the bank through Enbury and all that, and I think there was about six bombs dropped adjacent to the railway all the way up, because we could see the explosion. Our train caught fire and we was coupled up to it. It was an almighty explosion. Flames come out everywhere and this whole wooden thing was on fire within minutes. And we was coupled to it. I jumped down, uncoupled, and we shifted the engine away a bit. In March and April 1941, 
the Luftwaffe carried out seven nights of intensive bombing raids around Plymouth and Devonport. For the men who crewed the trains loaded with inflammable materials, this was an incredibly dangerous time. We could see all these flashes going up in the sky and the driver, he said, we're heading towards a raid. He said, we're going to Plymouth. And he said, so anyhow, he said, I'm going up in the signal box. He said to them, he said, I think it's a bit silly to let us go down into Plymouth with what we got on board. So the control said, oh, all right, driver. He said, uh, you stop there. And he said, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> he'd, he'd hardly got back to the engine where you go here these bombs go off and he was gone my mate out in a field and lying down <laughs> I was just, and I followed him then he said well, what we got on board if they drop something on here well, we're never going to come out of this one night there was me and my driver was working this cold train down to Plymouth. We were stopped at Hamilton signal box and the signalman shouted out to us that the red was on, but we were going to let us go down into Ocean Sidings. We got down to Ocean Sidings and we were stopped. You could hear all these bombs dropping and the hack hack and that going. And my driver said, oh yeah, I've had enough of this. He said, I'm going to get down and get under the tender. And um, I just huddled up in the corner where I was, like, see, hoping for the best. And all of a sudden, I heard this, you could hear the whistle of the boom coming, like, I thought, well, this is it. We've had it. There was an explosion, but muffled. And it had landed in the river. And the tide was out. And he oh, it made a hell of a noise. But the next thing I heard was, oh, shouting. I thought, oh, that's my mate. He, he've copped it. I pulled the flap back at the blackout, and he was climbing up now, and you've never seen anything like it in all your life. He got up, he was plastered from head to foot with mud out of this river. Thick mud all over. We managed to wash it all down with the pet pipe, what we used to keep the coal dust down with, and so we had a wait. Regular contact between crews and signalmen was fundamental to the smooth running of the railways. Even during air raids, signalmen kept to their posts, ensuring a great respect from the engine crews. When we were getting near Bishop Stain, the old engine started to rock. Oh, he said, there's something wrong with the track here. So, of course, the first box that was open was the uh, Hackney Yard box. So we stopped there, told the signal in, and he said, oh, thanks very much. He said, I'll stop all trains, all trains, he said, and out the road examined. And when we went up there, there was an unexploded bomb. We must have gone over that one. I, I mean, a chance in a million, that, I mean, he could have gone off. Unexploded bombs were a serious problem on the railways. Drivers would have to shunt wagons around a suspected UXB so that once effectively screened, other trains could pass. But drivers also had to manoeuvre their trains slowly as too much vibration would set off the bomb. One day, Charlie Rutherford and his driver had another war department load to deliver to Southampton a city that suffered 57 air raids during the war. The uh, station master, he said, there's an air raid red warning on a driver. He said, I've had a word with the signalman. He said, the best thing you can do is pull down into the tunnel and wait for further orders. But those further orders never came. Within moments of manoeuvring their train into the tunnel, the bombers were over Southampton. I said to the driver, I said, I don't know what you're going to do, but I said, I'm going to lay down under a coach. Took me overcoat and went down in there and laid down. Like that, but you couldn't drown the noise out. Bombs were dropping everywhere. Guns, there must have been guns going off and 
Oh, it's terrible. We were in that train all night in that tunnel. And, well, I thought we were never going to come out of this. I thought what, the next one's going to be over. It's like, we both thought we were going to be killed because it was just like hell on earth. All railway yards, stations and depots were provided with air raid shelters, often sited by the side of the track or near to signal boxes for quick access. In an emergency, crews felt a duty to protect their engines as best they could, but nowhere was entirely safe from a direct hit. No, the blitz had really started. We seen the engine was all right, and we got off the engine, cross the crossing, into the air raid shelter by the crossing, big one. There's only railway men in there, like. And there was this driver, guard, fireman, and it was really going some now, the bombs and the guns and everything. It was terrible. Now, the driver and the guard, they decide they're going to walk out of it. They ain't sticking it no more. So they went out the shelter, walked through Old Yard towards Sirehampton Way, but they didn't get too far, and a bomb come and killed a lot of them. Now, that was how those poor devils met it. The Blitz finally came to an end in May 1941, but many bombing raids continued. On the 4th of May 1942, Charlie Rutherford was firing with his driver on the late shift at St David's Station, Exeter. This particular night, the shunter came out, he said, nothing to pick up here, drive. He said, you've got a couple to pick up at the top yard. Oh, right, oh, well, of course, off we went. But within minutes of moving the train, enemy bombers arrived overhead. By now, the crew was too far away to make it to the station's shelter. The bombs missed them, but Charlie Rutherford wanted to know what had happened to the shunter. That poor chap got killed. Uh, they, they say it was a landmine, but I said oh, it was something pretty heavy because the top yard is quite away from where the, that was. And of course, what he must have done, he must have went in the shelter with some other chaps and they all got killed in there. Shelter had a direct hit. So that was luck for me. Eight railway workers lost their lives that spring night in 1942. By 1943, freight carried by Britain's railways had increased by 50% since the start of the war. Trains ran on British-produced coal, Yet the huge demand from the Royal and Merchant Navies meant ways had to be found to make coal go much further. This had a direct impact on the work of firemen. Some of the coal we had then was fine, dusty stuff, and it used to get in your eyes and sting. And the footplate used to get covered, and you'd be continually washing it down with the hose pipe. We were getting everything that would go in a firebox and burn. Some of the coal was like a lot of black oxo cubes. But you had all sorts of different coal. Sometimes you had almost a tender full of nothing but dust. And useless it was. You imagine what with the rattling of the train going along and all that, to be coming down and you was wasting half of it, it was going out over the sides. It's like pebbles rolling off. <laughs> what they call briquettes. They're about nine inch square grey, and you got a tender full of those, you're in trouble. Because to not steam out of those locomotives with those briquettes, it's like platting sawdust. You get your coal hammer with the pick and you slam the pick into the briquette and all it made was a hole. And you were smashing and smashing away at them and in 
a warm summer's day, the dust, the dust on your eyes when you'd had a week with them, when your eyes were just like red slits, matted up with the uh, chemicals that they made these briquettes out of. After three years of war, resources generally on the railways started to run low. Often, only essential maintenance work was carried out on rolling stock, with potentially lethal consequences for drivers and firemen. One summer's morning, we were going down into Bolton on an eight-mile bank, and on those locomotives, they only had one gauge glass in the middle, and that gauge glass burst. You see, the movement of the water, the movement of the water and the steam, where's the glass? And if they're not taken off every two, three months or so, they'll blow. So you've got steam and hot water hitting, and where does it go to you on the footplate? And it knocked me, that, that when that gauge glass burst on that story, it knocked me off my seat, because we were plunking down the, half asleep down the uh, incline. It knocked me off the seat, and all the side of my face was full of pieces of glass. And I finished up, I dropped, my mate slammed the brake on, the steam brake, and I dropped off on, uh, on the, the, the railway track. And then the, you couldn't see on the footplate, but it was just steam. Steam and scalding hot water, blowing all over. During the war, very little was invested in the railways and vital aspects such as track and signalling became increasingly run down. Even locomotives designated for scrap were brought back into service. Richard Hardy loved the railways so much, he used to work as a fireman in his spare time. On one occasion, he waited with his driver to replace the crew of a passenger train. They came in with a green arrow class engine, with a huge train of about 19 coaches. And we got on and they were in a terrible state. Water was right down in the boiler, low steam pressure, and uh, the driver simply said, before he got off, to, said to Bill Thompson, he said, she's a bastard, mate, and that was all. And that was all that they'd got to say to us, and they beat it as quickly as they could. I didn't half slave my guts out. Sometimes it was necessary for a little improvisation to keep Britain's railways going during the war. If you got an engine that was not steaming and it was a hellcat to make it steaming and it, it could be very, very frustrating, what you would do is open the smoke box door, the blast pipe, and you used to carry a piece of wire about the thickness of a finger, a long piece, put it over the blast pipes and fasten it and tighten it up tight. And that locomotive would steam like hell. But by 1944, as the long haul of the war began to take its toll, Britain's railways had to organise for the greatest use of its network ever. Preparations for D-Day. Despite the parlous state of Britain's railway engines, in the spring of 1944, drivers and firemen had to respond to the incredible workload that came with the preparations for D-Day and the invasion of France. 850,000 Allied troops and 10,000 tonnes of bombs needed to be transported to the south of England. In the final build-up during April and May 1944, over 500 special trains were on the move every day. We did th three trips to Plymouth with troops, bring the stuff back to Newton Abbott, and when you got back, there was another one there waiting to go. And this superintendent, he was pleading with the driver I had to do a third trip. We'd already done two trips, of course we had hardly any coal left on the engine. So they put, put some more coal on the engine, and we'd done a third trip with troops. I was falling asleep coming back on the third trip. I was practically exhausted. 
It was taking stuff from our area over onto the western and down towards Weymouth and places like that. So we would be moving oil trains from Thames Haven right way round London, right onto the western, like one particular night. I, I started off about two o'clock in the morning and I believe I had something like four different drivers in the day's work and I didn't get finished till Sunday morning. I was, I was on duty over 24 hours. Throughout the war, a specially designated train ferried VIPs around the country. These people would drive straight in on the platform, officers, whatever it was, get in the train and we was right away to London. Now everything was recessed for us. If there was a passenger, he got in out the way. Nothing had to stop the ghost train. We run into Paddington, they turned our engine, took water. The train was now back in the platform again. We would couple up to it and straight back to Bristol again in case he was wanted. Nothing stopped us. And he had the nickname of the ghost train. But in the highly charged prelude to D-Day, Sometimes the VIP treatment could become dangerous for railway workers, as Ron Trust found out when he crewed a train that provided backup services for the supreme commander of Allied forces in Europe, General Eisenhower. We were staying there overnight now with our locomotive to steam eat his train to keep it all warm, right? My mate said, he said, well, go and get some water platform we knew all where the water was there was a tap there we could go go along there of course I get down and go in there and all of a sudden hey oh and, 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 and he gun stuck right in front of me with a lead bayonet on oh Christ and uh, where are you going bud there's a Yankee soldier I said Christ I'm, I said take that thing away you're right up here he said where are you going I said, I'm going to get some water. I said, I'm the fireman. Look, you can see what I am. I don't know who you are. Guard, he shouted for the thinking, guard, no. You was told not to get off the locomotive. I said, yeah, we understand that. I said, but look, we've been on eight or nine hours now. I said, I said, I don't know where I expect he's having his bloody tea, you know, as <laughs> you got. And um, get back on your engine. So I get up and drivers and he said, where's the water? I said, I had never got there. Anyway, it wasn't long afterwards and shout, driver, driver, and this officer there, here you are. And he brought us up now, this big tray of rations and uh, coffee. I thought they wouldn't have tea. <laughs> With the successful invasion of France, all railway workers could share in a sense of achievement. But their efforts had to continue till the job was done on the 8th of May, 1945. I think we did our bit for the war effort. We had worked a lot of long hours. You never knew when you went to work, you never knew what time you were going to leave work. When you think we, we took the troops, um, to where they've got to be and uh, running the trains for their supply, for them to do their job. It was a sense of achievement to be a fireman, you know, and uh, nobody's going to take that away from me. Without the railways, you could not have moved anything. The whole country depended on the railways for passengers, for goods, for everything. And uh, when I used to walk home, with my railway hat on, and I felt so, always felt so proud. I was quite chuffed about what we'd done. Not only me, but all the footplate men, all the railway men. I used to think about the signal men, how they stuck it in the signal boxes, never come out, and worked as long as they could until a bomb or something stopped them working. During the Second World War, Nearly 400 workers were killed and over 2,000 injured whilst on active duty on Britain's railways. But the conflict saw the railways used more heavily than ever before. 
This could only have been achieved due to the dedication and resilience of drivers, firemen and all their colleagues who carried the war load to victory. For more information about our exclusive series, Their Finest Hour, visit our website, uktvhistory.co.uk. And don't miss our episode on the Bevin Boys, brand new tomorrow night at 10.